this house, we can do anything we want. You're listening to America's most liminal podcast, The Pod People. I'm Matisse Van Rossum, and how long have I been here? Weeks? Months? Days? Who uh, can do you want I to help you recollect? What, I don't know. Is this a lighthouse <laughs> reference? I, don't, I was tracking with the liminal space bit, but are we, uh, what's... 526 days, baby. Mm-hmm. Or 62. I am your favorite 3 a.m. boy, uh, Ben Sheets. Did you introduce yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, I'm, uh, <laughs> I, I'm forgetting things, uh, and lost in, I guess, yeah, I've, I've lost my sense of space and time. I'm, uh, Cleve Marink Mosier. <laughs> Cleve <Marink. laughs> Well, uh, yeah, we are here to discuss the brand new experimental horror film Skinamarink that has been uh, making a lot of buzz lately. Very surprised that this film got a theatrical release, a wide theatrical release. Especially after seeing it. We did, yeah, we did have to go to a special theater in Raleigh. We couldn't go to our normal theater to see this one. (laughs) What's so funny to me about it is, like, the theater we went to, the Cinemark in Raleigh, was, like, the old school the type cinema. of like movie theater ass movie theater where it's not like that quasi luxury experience that you get at like the fucking AMC. What or we're used to. Yeah. And what, what's <laughs> particularly odd is that this movie was acquired by Shudder. Yes, it is getting a wide Shudder release which later is owned this year. by AMC. So oh yeah. Why isn't it in AMC theaters? That that and I guess it's. Yeah. Well, I think Good it's question. in some yeah. AMC's, just not, not the just one not just not the one that we go to. I wish it was though, because I do prefer an AMC. Um, I I don't know. I I enjoyed this uh, this theater going experience. Yeah. It was it was yeah. it was fun being in a uh, in a different theater than we're used to. It was a little older. It gave me kind of feeling of nostalgia for the kind theater of for this movie. Yeah, I thought, I thought it was kind of perfect. Okay, maybe I'm starting. I feel kind of like I'm losing my little bit. I thought the picture was super blown out and the audio was way too goddamn loud. I thought that was just the movie. Yeah, I think I thought I, that was intentional. I've seen shots was... of the film. It was not that hard to 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 look at on other screens. I love Swimmy Grain, but like the open, some of the like the especially in the first half, like it was like actively like hard to see because it was so like the I, grain was so blown out. I I, 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 I thought think it was that's intentional. No, I, no, I've seen like it, other shots like not on. Like that projector, and yeah. I mean, I've well, I've you've seen it projected, like no, I've, I've okay, seen it on so normal seen screens it with, where I could make out what what I was looking at with compression, video compression. Sure, I I feel like this movie is an interesting one because I feel like it demands to be seen either in a theater or by yourself. In a basement on a CRT TV. <laughs> With the lights off. You know, on VHS. Like, I, this movie demands your attention and demands you to get on its wavelength it, or you're not going to have a good time. It demands a lot of I'm you. I'm raising my hand. And uh, yeah, this is probably going to be a little contentious episode. Cleveland is, uh, I almost feel like this movie made you angry. It did. Um, and I think Ben and I are on the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, so you're, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get the full, yeah. the full range. Uh, a little more background on Skinamarink. Uh, a trailer was released a few months ago. Uh, it sort of went viral. Uh, it was very evocative and spooky and weird. And uh, the horror community was like, hey, what the fuck is this? This movie's doing the uh, festival circuit right now. And it was uh, accidentally leaked from one of those festival screenings. So it got uploaded online. Kind of went viral uh, on TikTok as well. I'm not on TikTok, so I don't know the extent but I think all of this sort of contributed to the buzz that helped it get picked up by Shudder, which is cool, mm-hmm. and also helped it get a theatrical release. Um, it's written and directed by a guy named Kyle Edward Ball. He is a filmmaker who has done a lot of short films. He has a YouTube channel called Bite Size Nightmares. Right before we left for the screening tonight, I watched one of his films on YouTube called Heck, which is... Uh, the foundation of the idea for Skinamarink. He sort of extended that into uh, 
a feature length film, but yeah, this movie is super duper experimental and yeah. therefore is not for people who aren't into experimental film and that's okay. <laughs> I, I feel like this movie's trailer primed some people in our audience to, like, expect something that this movie wasn't. Right after the movie ended, we heard people behind us say something like, I don't think anyone in this theater found this scary, or something of that nature. Yeah. And I just kind of chuckled at well, that, because I, I found this movie horrifying. I counted I counted four walkouts during this movie, people who got up and left and never came back. Kind of expected that. To to double back to something we were saying earlier, this film demands a lot of you. And if you're not prepared to meet it's on meet it on its terms, I can one hundred percent see how it is an unpleasant viewing experience. Yep. It's almost two hours long. It is again extremely experimental, shot on like Maybe Super 8? I Probably not Super 8. It was actually but... shot digitally. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay. That's kind of surprising. But it has a very lo-fi aesthetic. It... it has the aesthetic of, like, old video. Like, old, like, 90s video. Like, a VHS tape that's been sitting in a garage and that's, like, kind of water damaged. Is the One of the things I loved about this film was the green. Because we have such a heavy use of grain in this movie where we have a lot of shots where like 80 to 100% of the screen is black. And black in this film is not like a static black. It's a constantly moving black where your eyes sort of start deceiving you at a certain point. Because walls feel like they're moving because there's so much grain on them that they don't feel flat. It's like when you way. it's like when you take mushrooms and just like sit in the dark and close your eyes. Like that's that's the kind of vibe that I got. Like the grain is hallucinogenic at a certain point because so much of the film is just black and like all of the shots are never showing the central action. We never see a face in this movie. Like all of the characters are pretty much completely off screen. The camera is just looking at like the ceiling or a door frame or something on the ground. And I th and it's in that sense it's not very visually exciting or auditorily or I, or I think I narratively think, or anything else. I think the sound. Design I think the sound is design is incredible. Point. It reminds me a lot of the caretaker, and uh, the caretaker's record. It's like empty bliss beyond the world and stuff like that, where it's on memory and kind of distorting the familiar, um, because you have very mundane things going on, but it it distorts itself and becomes unfamiliar. Through the way it's presented, um, go ahead. Cleve. Yeah, I think no, we gotta I'm, let Cleve no, get no, some no, of his no, honestly, frustration like, out. I wanna. I, 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 I'm okay with. I'm patient. You know, I know you y'all will give me my shot. That's fine. Um, and, and and I don't. I don't want to shit in the drinking water too early. In this metaphor, there is a point where it is what I'm supposed to do. But anyway, uh, I, I, I actually I have some more questions for you guys before I get into my my deal too. And that is, um, we've watched a number of experimental films on this podcast that feature slow shots that are quiet and ponderous and tension building and scary and i'm usually the person who likes them the most yeah agazusa uh lamb uh and and, and on green knight etc yeah I, you can't why why is it now we switch places what is what is it about this that you like over that which is far more gratuitously that in my opinion because those films are, I, I'm sorry, they're not experimental films. They're yeah. uh, Hagazusa. No, Hagazusa is maybe the closest, but they're all. Each of those films is presenting itself as sort of a narrative film, and just in those movies not a lot happens. This film is presenting itself as something completely different. I think, and I, I think, think okay. my, my problems with Hagazusa, with Green Knight, with stuff like that, is I watch the trailer and I'm like, whoa, that looks like a really cool, like, kind of arty, uh, spooky movie. Get into it and it's like, 
there's nothing fucking happening. And Skinamarink, I could tell from the trailer, like, I know what kind of experimental film this is going to be. I go into it prepared to meet it that way. That strikes yeah, me I as, think... a, a, like, kind of a, 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 a... And maybe I'm I'm perceiving this wrong, but to me that kind of, that feels fairly binary. Like, I think it, it, it's not, not a... It doesn't strike me as a matter of it being experimental or not. I think that the, the Green Knight and Hagazusa and lamb and whatnot are 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 films that like yeah they have core narratives and they are like accessible but like they they utilize experimentation they have like experimentative sequences and like in the past those have often been like those sequences have been sort of the complaint and i feel like those movies have a lot more going on than this stuff also 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 to be fair i haven't i didn't love any of those films as much as you did but i gave overall positive ratings to all three well, I, I didn't i didn't so i'll, yeah. I'll explain ben's why. maybe a little bit um, better one you know where all three of those movies you gave an example lamb green knight and mm. hagazusa were very much show don't tell movies where like they used visuals in the absence of you know exposition heavy plot and story to kind of tell their story this movie is more of a don't show, don't tell movie. It's more of a tone poem. It's more of That's capturing an atmosphere and vibe. Storytelling on the periphery. In that, like, most of this movie is the process of evoking a childhood emotion and memory and feeling. With this movie in particular, the reason it worked so well for me is it evoked a strong sense of nostalgia i remember but like as a kid you know bad nostalgia yeah yeah as a kid that's the interesting having thing. late night you know sort of hide and seek games with friends at strangers houses where you're in the dark and you can't see and you're in this uh this home but it feels like unfamiliar territory and everything feels strange and wrong and time dilates at a certain point and there's a feeling of dread and shifting elements to whether it's the walls or everything around you you don't know what's around the corner in the darkness just outside of your field of vision and that's what this film captures so perfectly because of that grain because of the way it's shot and how it's not person focused in the visuals it's person focused on the periphery you know in the shadows in the audio it just captures that so well i i i don't know how to talk about this super well without sounding pretentious but like i mean i think i think what you just described is pretty much perfect because that's exactly how it affected me too. And that that is a, a good distinction in comparison to those other films that Cleveland mentioned. It's like you go into those looking for some kind of narrative. And I think that my disappointment with all three of those films, even though I ultimately came away liking more than I disliked, sure. was that I was really hoping more would happen. And I did not go into Skinamarink looking for a, a narrative. The, the reason the trailer struck me is because it felt like that taste of, like, what it's like to be, like, four years old, wake up in the middle of the night, and you're scared of the dark, and you can hear, like, your parents watching TV in another room, and, like, you want to go out to be with them to, like have that comfort, but you don't want to walk down the hall by yourself. Or you're afraid that if you go into the living room, your parents are just going to pick you up and send you right back to bed. Like, it is, it's that kind of atmosphere and vibe and nostalgia distilled. And I think that, though I do have some problems with the length, I, I think that it it could be shorter it does sort of have this quality of like lulling you into that by just forcing you to sit in it for so long. And if you're not willing to give it that, then I can totally see how it's just like, this is fucking boring. I'm, I want to get out of here. I want to go do anything else because nothing's really happening. But if you're, if you are willing to, 
surrender yourself to it in that way, I think it is really engrossing and horrifying. Yes. And that's the thing is like nostalgia is such a big thing in film these days. Everything is trying to cater to a sense of nostalgia because times are bad. Times have been bad. And we always look back at the past with rose tinted glasses and we want to feel those warm, fuzzy feelings of being a kid again. But this film reminds you that, hey, actually, sometimes being a kid is really, really fucking scary. And I like that. And that is like, I, when I was a kid, I was, I think a lot of kids are, but when I was a kid, I was particularly terrified of the dark. I was very, very scared of the dark. And I've been over that for fucking, you know, well over two decades at this point, right? But this movie brought back that fear of the dark, that feeling of being afraid of the dark and being so afraid of the dark in a space that should be comfortable and familiar, your own house. Yeah, I think they do that perfectly. They capture the, you know, that fear of the dark in such a tangible way because of the green, because of how it's shot in a way that I haven't seen in movies before. And you know, I will say, like, for a directorial debut, this is a very confidently made movie. Like, Well, a feature-length directorial yeah, sure, debut. Sure. He's got a full YouTube sure, channel of shorts sure. like this. Um, but the thing is, like, I will say, I didn't mind the length because it felt like time was dilating. And, like, that's part of the atmosphere of the whole thing. As a kid, you know, a 15-minute time to yourself can feel like hours, hours you know? Yeah. Um, so that felt like very evocative in its own way. I think the thing that, the one thing that didn't work for me with this movie is the few times that it did have jump scares. Yes. Because I feel like this movie was extremely confident in what it was doing for the most part, where, to the point where I understand why a lot of people don't like it. Because, like, you're either on board and you get on the same wavelength as it, or you don't. When it goes into jump scare territory, it feels like it's not as confident. It took me out of it so bad. And that's, that's I think, my, my biggest complaint about this film by my... I think that we are, logically, between the three of us, we're on the same page. I feel like emotionally that's maybe where we're gonna be you know like into yeah it just it just didn't like, hit it just didn't hit you in the same well, way and yeah, well mm, like yeah like, i i have a lot of points about it but i'll give it a little bit longer first but while we're touching on on the jump scares it, it's one of the reasons why i left kind of angry at the movie is is that i was really trying to get on that level and i really wanted to be there and in that space but the fucking jump scares just wouldn't stop and it left it did not leave me afraid it left me agitated the jump scares and, in this are cheap and it's and they're they're really cheap i agree and and it's like and I, I i want and this is this is one of those circumstances where you know this is this happened plenty of times in the podcast where like i'm more bitter about this movie because it's almost something i would adore like it is it is so many of my i guess you know i am gonna get into my bit now like it, it is it is so many of my favorite aesthetics i like on paper, I am hearing all the words that you're describing, like right now, saying like, "Oh, when you're a child in the dark," and I, 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 I so deeply agree with that. I am obsessed with grain. I love this aesthetic, and I love what they're trying to do and what they're trying to capture. And I, and I think it's really bold of them to try it, even. Um, but I, I, I think I think that they they really really fucked up with with like just the the overuse of jump scares, and it just it took me out of it. And it's it's frankly all that's left. The tension is the most important part of this movie. Like, like when you're a child and you're looking into the darkness and you're waiting for that creature to come out and your mind is just conjuring that imagery and the, the TV is flashing and it's playing on the walls and your, your imagination is getting the best of you. And, it's, it, and, and the, that's when the, the creatures come out or you, you think you see something or a, a picture frame just happens to fall off the wall at the wrong time and it utterly terrifies you. As a, as a child, right? Like I'm super on board for all of that, and and I and I and right right when I when I feel like I'm I'm there, the movie like pulls some jump scare bullshit, or it just hard cuts to another shot of nothing, and it it just it was just constantly like regularly taking me out of the experience, and and I felt like the 
the grain too, like at least on the projector we were watching it on, because like I feel like I've seen other shots of the film that didn't that weren't that hard to see. Like I could barely make out what was like in the scenes to begin with, and that to me wasn't scary. And again, this is that's this is definitely heart, right? Like this is more personal. Um, the the shots and the angles like played up so art house, like so abstract that you just you have no ground to begin with. I, I felt like there was, there's no rug to be pulled out from under me at a certain point. I was just sort of in the ether to begin with, and there wasn't a sense of time that was established for time to be taken away from me. So I was just left with just sitting at these long shots where, like, I couldn't really see what was going on. And, like, I wasn't, I wasn't afraid. I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was looking down that dark hallway. And that's what's so confusing to me is, like, I wanted that experience. I wanted that feeling of, like, looking down into the dark and, and being afraid of what might come out of the shadows or whatever. But, like, instead, like, really early on in the movie, it introduced that the spaces are changing by this, like, just things, like, kind of just, like, boop, popping in. And I thought it was funny. Like, it was like Italian Spider-Man. Like, when, like, the, 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 the snakes just kind of appear over them and shit. Like, whenever the door frames and stuff, which is pretty early on into the film, like, they just kind of, like, beep. Like, they just kind of pop in. It's, personally, I didn't find that to be, like, intimidating or scary, and it didn't feel ethereal. It was just, it was so upfront. It didn't, it didn't do anything for me. Yeah. Like, and it's a shame because, like, that's my favorite thing, playing with space and playing with time. I'm, I, I you know, like, I, I love, um, yeah. House of Leaves. I love, uh, um, what, 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 the Night House. You know, like, films like that and books like that and games that, that play with your sense of space-time are so cool. And I feel like just having, like, hallways kind of pop in and out is is the cheapest way to do it. There we go. I'll, I, I can get into it more later, but yeah. I'll, I'll let you guys talk for a bit. I mean... And please See, don't let me convince I, I think, you. If you like the you know, movie, like, like I, I mean, there's no, no. there's no the, danger the of that, my dear. <laughs> yeah. I, and I, 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 I think you're coming... Same thing you, you said that you started with is, like... Logically, I understand a lot of what you're saying. I just didn't feel that way. I think the film does a great job, a fantastic job of that staring, literally gazing into the void. This film is like void gazing the movie and being afraid that something is going to come out of the darkness and like combining with like the movement of the grain all of the visual noise and that and the sound like i think all of that shit is so evocative and it's like you say there's no rug to be pulled from under you like yes you're right I wasn't looking for a rug to be pulled from under me in a movie like this. You're floating in the ether. Yes, correct. That is what I went into this movie. I, I'm submitting myself to the ether. I'm jumping into it to float around and in, in the void and be afraid. And, like, you're saying all the right things. It just didn't affect you in the same way that it affected me yeah, or, no, or Ben. Yeah, and I, well, I, I think... So I think it, in, in this sense, we're on, we're on the same page, mostly. It's just how we feel about it how, yeah. it, how it was, how effective it was for each of us individually. Yeah, and I feel like your critiques are very similar to my critiques for something like Hagazusa, where I didn't feel like there was enough to grasp onto to really keep me compelled. And, like, for this movie, the thing that I grasped onto was this really tangible memory and vibe that, you know, felt like I have been in a situation like that in some form before. Something that I think... You know, metaphysically. Something that I think the film does really effectively in that same vein is that early on, you know, once the kids wake up and their dad is missing and all the windows and doors in the house have mysteriously vanished, the first thing they do is they seek the safety of the living room and the television, right? Makes sense for kids. You put on your cartoons so it distracts you from being scared. And what I love about the movie is that how, especially by the time we get close to the end, how much that living room like by the tv feels like an island in like just a sea of black yeah a hostile you know environment like that that is the point of safety 
where nothing bad happens. It's when the kids venture out into the darkness, when they're lured out into the darkness by the voice that continually beckons them. It's like, you're like, no, don't leave the TV. Stay there with your cartoons, you know? <laughs> like, I feel like that. I feel like a kid. It's like, no, I want to stay here with my cartoons. The voice told me to come upstairs. I don't want to go upstairs. Well, one of the <laughs> scariest things, too, is even that sense of safety is pulled from out under you. You know, I think that of the ro repeated motif of that bit of the cartoon where... That starts uh, looping? Yeah, of the, like, rabbit that's kind of smushed into the ether and disappears. And that's played over and over again. Uh, you know, and I feel like that's kind of what is really happening to thought, a lot of things in this movie. I thought it was kind of beating me over the head with it. Sorry to chime in this fucking Eeyore. No, that's but, fine. Like, I, uh, I, I thought that... Like it was, it was ham fisted, and that's all there was. Like, yeah, I was like, uh, you know, when after it repeated the, the the first time, I was like, yeah, I get it. And then it repeated like over and over and over again. I'm like, yeah, I I still get it. I'm still just sitting here, just savoring each individual bite of popcorn. Like, <laughs> like to me, was... <laughs> it's it's not something that it's it's saying to the audience. It's saying it to the four year old child. You know, it's trying mm. to imply something to the character specifically. And I find that creepy because it's sort of a malevolent force in the perceived area of safety. And it's the same thing with the toys and the Legos shifting and the things sticking to, to the, the wall. wall. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just takes the kind of safe ground that you think is safe and secure and it pulls it out from under you and shifts it and makes it unknown. Yeah. And that's that that was really spooky to me. I think I agree with you, Cleve, to an extent on the early sections where things pop in and out paired with the sound effect. I thought that was a little too direct. I think a lot of the other times in the film where they they play with uh spatial understanding to be a lot spookier. Yeah. Like I I almost think that the the heavy-handedness of like the windows and doors like flashing in and out of existence at the beginning is sort of a necessity of the medium in this case because it never gives you a chance to like have just because of the way it's shot, it never gives you a chance to understand the space that you're in. So how are you going to know if the windows and doors are missing without being shown somehow? Well, and if you don't have an idea of where the windows and doors are to begin with, like I'm not I'm yeah, not disagreeing I, I'm not disagreeing that it's like heavy handed and it does feel like kind of one of the bigger moments where it's like showing the strings kind of the fact that it was paired with a sound effect yeah it does like this weird yeah, like yeah. hum sound effect like Ooh. Yeah, it's, it's like a door pops scary. in and, yeah and the I toilet mean, disappears at one point yeah yeah I, I i don't i i don't disagree that like i don't think it's the most effective way to do it just like i struggle to think of a better well, way think, in the context i think of, i know of the film. a better way because they do it later in the film uh Slow you know rate. the well, yeah the, yeah, the mother is sitting on the edge of a bed in a mm. very dark shot. And as you watch, like, she kind of fades into the grain. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it just shot. holds there. And it's very confidently shot because it's su super subtle. You know, it's just a static shot. Or That's fair. Just, like, That's fair. the grain, too. She kind of, like is pulled up into herself and it is it is very similar to like the, the cartoon rabbit you know thing in that sense too and again like i, I sorry I, I'm, I'm pinching my fingers together he's I'm, doing I'm, italian hands i'm doing an italian hand uh very close to my face just kind of quivering like it it's it's I'm, I'm grasping for like the thing i love more than anything else like it is the idea of being vanished into the void of being disappeared is so fucking cool. Like, for fuck's sake, like, what's our big game called, right? It stares back. It's it's my favorite fucking thing. And I think the movie does it really well. <gasps> yeah. <laughs> at times, at times, yes. Like there are there are moments and, and it's 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 just I I I feel like they, those moments are gems. They they really are. 
And it's just that I, I felt like with the jump scares and the art house shots and the rest that I was having to fucking, like, wade through just shit to get to them. And I know it's not very fair, I, but, like, it's just, to me, it was, like, and that's that's what was so frustrating about it is, like, god damn it, you have these cool things and I'm having to, like, work so hard to enjoy them. And I, I resent that. But, no, that shot is so fucking cool. And, and the concept... Is super neat. We have a can, doing it here after you. Well, I just had a question for you. I, you go for I I'm a bit confused at the 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 phrase art house in the way you're using it. Do you mean like the the minimalism, that the framing, is? the cinematography, like the the shots of like we never see, like we rarely see people in frame. It's always just like their feet in the bottom of the shot or like the top kind of half corner of a doorway. I think that that is the non the non traditional aspects of it kind make of the it yeah, that's, that's the non the non traditional aspects of it make it art house. Yeah. I I I think that's I think that that is fair. Yeah. I I this is an art house movie. I do think so. Mm-hmm. I think it's an art house experimental film. Period. But um, like, and again too like. But I don't I don't think that's negative. I think no. I think art I love house. Some art house I think shit. art house shit gets a bad rap. I yeah, don't think. But art house shit is well, inherently bad. My my favorite thing to do with experimental <laughs> stuff is to treat it like you're spelunking the minds. Uh, music is probably my favorite way for that, right? Like, listening to, like, like particularly kind of weird or experimental artists and checking out how artists can, can act like mad scientists, you know? And, like, yeah, failed experiments on their own can be kind of fascinating and cool. And, like, there are, there are neat ideas there. And, like, it, you know, in that environment, like, it, it is healthy to look at them that way. And at the end of the day, like, I'm happy this movie exists. But it, it th- this movie can only exist as what it is once. You know, may- maybe a few decades down the line or whatever else like that. Or you can just d- use the similar tools to tell a different story. But can we get into the narrative? Yeah. Okay. Sure. The idea of two children. Because like, cause we can summarize pretty much the whole narrative pretty pretty briefly because this film is exclu- almost exclusively vibes. It's a vibes piece, um, yeah. It's about two children who are in the house with their parents. And the family is essentially spirited away by like a liminal entity, and it's and a pretty a pretty literal way to describe it. But yes, yes. Well, right. Well, well, I'm just I'm trying to describe what plot there is. So yeah, I have to be literal. But like that is that is the core of what's happening. If you had to put words to it, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Like there's some sort of liminal entity that is fuckering with everything, and we're getting that from a child's perspective. That is the coolest fucking premise ever. What am I always saying is my, my favorite thing, right? Astral fucking fey horror shit, right? I love Annihil- like I know Annihilation is about a, like a space cancer, but like it's it's essentially a fey. Dark, like fey film, sure. right? In that sense, like she's going into a realm that has different rules and different laws. It's my favorite aesthetic and I'm constantly glomming onto that. And that's essentially what this movie is. If, if you want to put like a folklore veneer over it they've they've been vanished into the fae like it's it's a, it, it is in a sense a fae sure movie and you know whether or not they, they literally like put fairy wings on it or whatever else like that which is frankly better you don't you don't want to that's super cool it's it's a liminal demon they've fallen into their own version of the back rooms or whatever i love that i think that's awesome i think the back rooms are super fucking cool uh, I think I, that's another reason why this film got so popular in the viral marketing yeah. is because everybody's super hot on the back rooms mm-hmm. right now, and everyone's like, "Ooh, back ro- the back rooms!" And I, and I generally I find the general like fandom reaction to all that stuff annoying. Sure, like with literally anything, but like I- inherently, like the, that first episode of it that was put out there is like on its own, minus all the stupid, silly deep lore that kind of t- takes me out of it. Like, it's super fucking neat, and it's a fun idea, and it's a fun piece of Well, I mean, I I haven't seen, like, the back room's, like, videos and stuff, but, like, I'm familiar with, like, the the basic creepypasta or whatever, and I think this film is everything that is great about the idea of the back rooms, is that, like, you are just all of a sudden in an unexplained liminal space that you cannot get out of, and... That's it. And what is happening? Who fucking knows? How did you get here? Who fucking knows? But it's scary. Yeah. I, I've been reading House of Leaves this last week, and it reminds me a lot of that. Because yes. it's, oh, yeah. it's sort of a... 
metaphysical home invasion movie, right? Like, yeah, you're oh taking, yeah, sure. You're taking the oh, idea yeah. of the home and making it making the familiar so unfamiliar by messing with spatial boundaries and things like that. And I think that at its core is like one of the film's strongest suits. And when it leans into that, it works super well. I one of my favorite shots of the movie is we cut to a room that's just full of Legos with like a speak to talk like cassette player mm -hmm. and the the camera keeps cutting back 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 further and further away from that room where at first it looked like a tiny room of its own and as it pulls further and further back it's like a long hallway where that's at the end of it yeah and it's that idea of like playing with the idea of the space you recognize to make it something that feels off yeah. or unfamiliar somewhere between familiar and not liminal like yes yes and and, and I, I i adore that shit um and, and that's what i find so horrifying about like liminal photographs like mm -hmm. i i think they're very unsettling for that same reason because yeah. you think of like the spaces on the periphery of them and, you know, the term liminal space is very... Uh, it's almost lost its meaning. It's, yeah, it's one so of those things that's almost lost its meaning. Yeah. People will just be like, oh my god, that's so liminal. It's like, no, it's not really. Like, people will use that term to describe anything that's, like, old yeah. and kind of spooky. But I think that to make a truly liminal space, there kind of inherently has to be nothing happening. And that's kind of what's scary about it, because if you find yourself in that place, it makes you feel even more out of place, because it's like, I'm here in this world that is just existing despite me. You know, and that, like, I am an intruder upon that space. And this film isn't exactly that because, obviously, there is, you know, some kind of entity or something, whether that is the space itself, there is some kind of malevolent outside force that is acting upon these children. But I think that for a lot of the film around that stuff, it's like... You're constantly waiting for something horrifying to happen. And for a lot of the film, nothing happens. It's so slow. It's so drawn out. Like, it's so quiet that it's like you spend, like, 15 minutes waiting for something to happen and nothing does. And then finally something does. And it's all the more horrifying for it because you've been sitting in that tension for so long it almost feels like sleight of hand at times because it feels like nothing is happening and then you realize looking back on it that a lot has happened in that time that you haven't even recognized like i think of the the girl kaylee going up to her parents and then kind of being acted upon upon you know by the force um and... that scene is super is like one of the spookier scenes yeah and yeah when, when she's she's called upstairs yeah that scene is really effective and she goes into her parents bedroom and up till this point part of the whole thing is that like the parents are gone and she walks into the bedroom and it, it's again just like the rest of the movie it's super dark you can barely make out what's going on but you can see that there is a person sitting on the bed like facing away from like the camera wall facing yeah. the wall yeah um and, and you can really just make out like their hips and legs going off the side of the bed that's about what you can see of them it's like some pajamas yeah well you can you can see their in that first shot where she goes in you can see the upper body because they're wearing like a white t-shirt that's like really all you can make out but then she works her way around the bed and this is done in kind of like a first person kind of deal mm -hmm. um and then, yeah, because she's so low to the ground, you can just see, like, the pajama pant, like, the legs and a hand sitting there. And the voice of her father or whatever asks her to look under the bed. And she does, and it's, like, 
just darkness. It's like there's nothing fucking there. And she looks under there again. And you're, again, the whole time you're waiting for something to pop out. And nothing fucking does. But then when she comes up from the bed, then her dad is gone. And she's across the bed. Her mom sitting there facing away from her. What I like is actually it's, uh, she looks up a second time and she sees her mother is there now. She wasn't before. And then she looks over and daddy's gone. Yeah. And yeah, I yeah, like yeah. that. I, li- I like that about it. No, this is one of my favorite scenes in the movie because things are happening. Like, yes, that's I like, true. I like, true. I like that part. Um, things are happening. Uh, and, and I felt, and, and again too, things are happening, but they're happening really slowly like yeah. that that sequence that we're describing like is over the is drawn out of minutes several and minutes, minutes and yeah it's like and and that but that's the the is tension is just great. almost unbearable yeah. yeah and that sequence it's, it's fucking great the problem is is that like for me like that 15 to 20 minutes beforehand where nothing also happens is i i've crossed the threshold at that point yeah. and I, I just i've entered boredom like See, I, it's, it, 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 it's i i think i think that tension uh in in this in this format like works well like played out like rhythmically i think there needs to be a loop there um for it to be effective for me at least and i think for like your, yeah. your average audience as well and and this is why i think that like the, the these concepts of liminal space they are they're really effective in photographs they're really effective in shorts and i think that you could totally do it in a movie i i do i do believe that but I think in this movie, like, there's little here that I, I don't think could have been much more effective in a short. If this movie had been, like, pieced into shorts or, or something, I think I would have gotten maybe a little bit more enjoyment out of it. Um, where I could, like, step away from it and live my life for a little bit or something. Um, at least then I would have been pr- probably be more tolerant of the jump scares. I, I don't know. I, I felt the, the pacing to kind of cross past it being bold and brave for not doing things for so long and it going right back into being amateurish. Like I thought, uh, yeah, that like just for, especially when like so many of those sequences are interrupted by n- bullshit jump scare fake outs. Yeah. Like, that, and, I, and like, that's, that that's scene, where, like, I just, I think it's amateurish. I don't think it's effective. That it scene well isn't done. it with a jump scare I, that I, I didn't like. I will like. say like, I totally see where you're coming from and I understand why a lot of people would feel that way. To me, I feel like the duration is kind of necessary to fall into the atmosphere of this movie where I don't feel like I could fall into the same type of tangible atmosphere in something that would be that's five minutes. You know? Yeah. I mean, I think I, I was, I, and, and, you know, well, not five minutes. No, like I think not two hours. Yeah. I think the idea of having to sit in this and feeling like just the time dilating around yeah. events that are happening where, it seems like sometimes a lot of things are happening very quickly and then other times nothing is happening for a really long time. I, I don't know any circumstances where, thing, where it felt like things were happening quickly, but... I mean, there's a point where, you know, uh, Kev- Kevin? Kevin's a yeah, little boy, yeah. The little boy uh, is told to stab himself in the eye and he does, presumably... And we see the aftermath of it in terms of the blood. And then he calls the the police. And that happens within, like, probably, like, ten minutes. Ten minute span, the two of those things. And it feels like a lot is going on in that period of time. Where, like, other in times In comparison it feels to the rest like, of the movie, yeah. Everything yeah everything is like, drawn out. Yeah, it, where yeah. it feels like it's expanding and contracting time. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And I think that, like, part of the effectiveness of the of the, like really spooky scenes like the look under the bed scene is i feel like the the 15 minutes before that of relatively nothing happening has like almost hypnotized me into like a state where i'm even more susceptible to the tension of that scene or something like it now where i totally agree with you is that that scene is capped off with a totally fucking unnecessary jump scare that's literally just a loud noise and a lot of the jump scares in this movie are that and i agree they do not feel as confident as the rest of the movie it feels like a it feels like a half-hearted attempt to cater to the mainstream horror audience who is not going to like this movie to begin with. And I think that 
in even making a movie like this, you already have to just go ahead and write a certain percentage of the audience off. As any kind of experimental artist, you have to acknowledge that you are making this art for, first and foremost, yourself and the weird niche freaks who are into that kind of shit. Yeah, and I, I you feel know? like, in theory... And to, tr- to do the fucking jump scares feels like, oh, this is a horror movie, remember? Yeah, yeah and the thing is, to me, like, in theory, like, having jump scares in a movie like this could work in terms of, like, a foreign sound from, you know, on the other side of the wall that surprises you. I think there's, like, like we, one, maybe we, two yeah, effective jump scares like in that. this. But there's a big difference between that and seeing a smiling telephone toy that changes faces suddenly. And, that was uh, good. See, I was going to say, that's like, like the one jump scare in the movie that I thought was good. Yeah. Is that spooky? Like that is that one. spooky little smiling phone toy? Yeah, me too. I thought that was a real, and like, that's the, kind of, how, that's the kind of thing like, it feels like, oh yeah, it feels like my mind is getting away from me. What I found really frustrating. Well, because like, the sound, the, 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 the jump scare, the jump scare is the there. sound of the phone ringing, which like a little toy like that isn't supposed to ring like a real phone. So like, I thought that was good. And also yeah. like the setup before that, where it's like totally dark and you can kind of see the suggestion of the eyes just from the white and they turn on the flashlight and it's like all of a sudden there's this creepy little well, it's smiling the, phone toy on there. the flashlight first and there's a moment where it's just the toy and you think, oh, it's another fake out and then it rings. Yeah. And then it does the face thing. And I thought that was great. And because it wasn't a fake out, it was a fake fake out. And that's good. It's like that's the good. it's like those the one the, it's like the one effective jump scare in the movie. The, yeah. the Nighthouse does those like mm-hmm. and way better too. But like I think that moment was a good moment. Like yeah. that was that was solid. It's just it's unfortunate because like when that moment hit me, I was like, damn, that was cool. I really wish there had been anything else like that for the past hour and a half. That would have been neat. I would have really that's, loved to have seen something like that. Yeah. That's totally Fire fair. Then. Well, that's the thing. Like, I, I like that jump scare. It felt a little cheap to me personally, but I did like God, it. God, in comparison think, to all think, the other ones in the yeah, fight. I mean, for example, like, with Kaylee having no face. Yeah. You know, and it just that's cutting cool. close and being loud and in your face jump scare. That felt cheap. It felt cheap. At least, like, it was something kind of cool to look at again. Yeah. Because like, cause that, that first half of the movie, like, that's it. That one shot, and it lasts a little second, like, is the only bit of anything to look at. There were a lot of cool opportunities to have spectral shapes sort of appearing and creeping out of shadows or doing anything like that. And there isn't anything like that. It's too direct See, for, like, for, a, yeah. for a movie like this. No, I think... I, but, but, I but, whoa, like... whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on. Like, it, it, you, you say it, it's, it's too direct for a movie like this, but this movie, like, the only thing it does instead is a spooky face and a loud noise. That and is I'm, way more direct. And I'm saying that th- that those are complaints I have about yeah, the movie. That's that I don't, when it feels the that least I don't, confident. That's when it feels the least confident, and those are Ooh, my yeah. least favorite parts of the movie. Mm-hmm. And I think having shapes coming out of the shadows or hands reaching out towards the kids or whatever, for this type of movie, for what I'm looking for this type of movie, that's too direct. And when they do the fucking cheap ass jump scares is way too direct. Even like more, yeah. I yeah. I think that for the most part the fact that we just have the voice, the distorted voice that is like calling to them throughout the movie, that is fucking spooky as shit. It's a scary sounding voice. It is, and it's always changing yeah. too. I will say another element with that that I found really effective is one of the final shots of the film where it's very grainy, but you can kind of make out a face. That's the very final yeah. shot of yeah. the film. And I agree. I think it is a extremely haunting way to end the film. Because at this point, the like 10 or so minutes before this has been pretty much devoid of the characters. Because they've the kids have both gotten got at this point. So we're just kind of... It's just like us as the audience alone in the house while we see strange things happen and then the final shot of the film is like you said it's so so dark and grainy and you can get just the very faintest impression of a child's face sort of off in the darkness and again throughout the entirety of this movie we have not seen another human face we've barely like seen 
the kids at all. Usually, if anything, it's like their legs walking or like the hands or something. We get like one shot where we're like behind the little boy. You see the back of his head, but there have been no faces in this movie. And then there's just kind of the impression of this face in the darkness. And you hear the little boy's voice and he tells you to go to sleep and then asks you your name twice. And then, and then it ends. So I thought it was the boy looking at it. And it was, that was the face of the thing. Oh, so yeah, I, that's it. how I perceived it. I thought it was the creature. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was the too. boy. Because it, it's so indistinct. Because at it that, because at that point, because at that point, the boy, I, because both of the kids have gotten got. So I thought it was, I thought it was him talking to us as the audience and inserting us into the I didn't think both the kids had them. gotten got. I thought that like the, the weird reversal blood spray stuff was like the sister being killed. Because she, her face was removed, like it took her mouth, as it says. Yeah, that was that was cool. Well, she gets like, got earlier when, and then there's the part where it's just the little boy in the room by himself, and then he, you know, calls the police, and then he's talking to the entity in the darkness, and it tells him to come upstairs. That's when, like, all of the like weird time and space and stuff, the upside down, all the upside moves. down stuff, the I shifting. Was really I, cool, by the way, yeah, no, I thought so too, and I, I interpreted that as the boy being swamped into the void, and then what's left is us, the audience, alone in the house, and the creature talking to us. Oh, I, I, I mean, maybe through the through the boy or whatever. I, I, I thought that that see, was. I thought well, I, I. I do like how abstract it is. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm not. I'm. I don't think there's a a right answer For necessarily. Um, that's just that's how I read one it. One thing that I wondered about with this movie is, you know, it's set in 1995, mm-hmm. and it's very evocative of a specific time of like 90s middle class suburbia. Yeah. Um, that doesn't really exist anymore. Um, I think that's why it worked so well with me, but I don't know if it would work well with people that are a lot older or a lot younger, because that is a very tangible it's, feeling. It's a, it's a I, very... I think, it, I think it would, only because like we like stuff from earlier eras, and we can feel nostalgic for those times we weren't in for the same reason. I think it'll yeah, still work. I think it'll I still mean, work on Zoomers. Kind I of. I don't know if it's us. the same kind of nostalgia, though. Like... I don't know. I can't say I have like direct nostalgia for the 80s because I wasn't alive during the 80s, but I remember watching some 80s cartoons when I was growing up, so it's like kind of indirect nostalgia. But like this is is a different I I think Ben does have a point. And you know, I'd be curious to talk to somebody uh in a generation older or younger than us and see how they they feel about it. But like, yeah, this is set in 95. Like I was <laughs> Two in ninety five. Cut, cut to Tease pulling up in a van next to a children's park. Hey kids, have y'all seen Skinner? Hey kids, have any of you kids seen Skinnerink? How did it make? How did it make you feel? But it's like, yeah, it is a very specific kind of nostalgia that I feel as a child who grew up in the nineties. Well, I, I I should ask you this question because I think you're the closest age to Kevin in the movie. Yeah, I was. I was uh, four. Yeah, like, did in ninety five or three, whatever. Ninety five. Yeah. Uh, did that? Re- did yeah, you're not. You're nine months old. You're nine months older than me. Yeah. So yeah, did, that, yeah comparatively. Did the the vibes of this resonate with you and feel like something that you've experienced before? Yes. Okay. Like that, that's why. Like earlier, I was describing like looking around a house and a picture falls off the wall and something scares you and you run upstairs, you know, afraid or or down the hall or whatever. Like yes, of course. Like and again, that's why I'm so pissed off pissed off at this movie is because like I very much so identify with this and I really wish that it had, hadn't done the, the bullshit jump scares and it, it hadn't like been its own worst enemy like taking me out of the film like uh, or or boredom I think that um a better filmmaker could have could have kept the viewer enraptured for longer that's your job as a filmmaker yeah generally. well i mean i don't think that's fair to say a better filmmaker because he successfully kept ben and i enraptured and other people who like skin him a rank i don't think that he's a bad filmmaker because he didn't connect with you it's just I he think, was well I, I think that the i think i think that those cheap jump scares were bad filmmaking 
Like, yes, and, we've we have, we all agree that the cheap jump I mean. scares are bad filmmaking, but there's so much more of this movie than that. Yeah, and how there's many so jump much more of this movie really than that. Really, are there in this movie? There's four, like four or five. Four or five. Yeah, over the course of a two-hour movie, there's yeah. like one every twenty minutes, and I agree. We all agree the jump scares are mostly cheap and frustrating and annoying, but I do reject boiling the entire film down to those cheap jump scares sure, and I'm saying not, that well, he's I'm a not, like bad said, like, filmmaker because he's made some bad decisions in the no, film. Well, okay, I, well, I, in, in no capacity am I saying exclusively bad because, like, again, I, I've, I, we've, I've been I've been here this whole time saying like you know like like praise, praising the good as well, but my issue with it is is that. Again, those long periods where I could be enraptured. I'm just waiting for, like, even if he only did four or whatever throughout the movie, because they're so, they're so long and they're so spread out, and he, and he introduces them pretty early, I'm just sitting in the darkness waiting for him to do another bullshit jump scare. And, like, which which is what really, like, took me out of the experience, personally. And I and I feel like, when I'm, when I'm talking about boiling things down, when we're talking about, like, a, like boiling things down, right? Like, yes... It is usually, like, unfair artistically to do that in some capacity. I agree. On the other side of that coin, there are general practices and, and, and shared universalities, you know? And yeah, like, sure. And I think, I think that, you know, like, those conventions, like, breaking some of those conventions is not really useful or valuable when they're not well broken. Right. Yeah, but what? It, but well broken is subjective. We're talking about whether the filmmaking is bad or not, and that's that's what I reject. If it doesn't click with you, if it doesn't vibe with you, that's fine. But this is a film that is made with very clear intent. He's not just winging it. He's not just not shooting the kids because he doesn't want to fuck around with it. He's not just shooting the wall because he doesn't know how to frame a shot. Like, there's a very clear intent in the type of storytelling that he's trying to achieve. Now, whether that clicks with you or not is a totally different deal, and I... 100% understand why it doesn't click with you and most of the theater that yeah. we were sitting well, in. And I totally get that. You know, but, it's very inaccessible. Yes. Like, that's the thing. You can make a more accessible version of this movie, and it might click with more people, including you, Cleve. I don't mind that it's inaccessible and oblique and, you know... Uh, incongruable sometimes and impenetrable even at times where you don't completely understand some of the finer details because the thing is for me my imagination fills in the gaps mm -hmm. you know i think that's part of horror is not necessarily always what you show but what you don't show you know yeah and and i think that it's perfectly fair to be bored by this movie. 100%. Sure. I think it's totally fine because in comparison to 99.9% .9 of the rest of the movies out there, yeah, not a whole lot is going on. It's a lot of shots. It's a lot of really grainy, dark shots of looking at the wall and looking at the floor. And <laughs> when when you boil it down to that, like, yeah, it is, it's kind of boring. And there were times where I was a little bit bored too. But what it does so effectively is evoke that feeling of being a child and mm -hmm. being scared of the dark. And I think that that's what it's trying to do. And I think in that sense, for me, it is successful. And yes, it's an inaccessible movie for a lot of people. And yes, it expects work out of you. And I think that it is okay to be frustrated that a film expects you to work for it. Most films don't, and they I don't think films necessarily should expect you to work. A lot of times when you're watching a movie, you want to sit down and be entertained. And when you want to be entertained and a film is like, no, you have to fuck you have to try to engage with this on a more 
fucking metaphysical intellectual level it's like fuck you why why should i why should i have to engage with this movie like that well and i think that it's okay to be turned off by that mm -hmm. well i i think too and like on the other end of that like i went into this movie really wanting to engage with it on on an intellectual level that that's where i'm coming from on that side and what i really liked is all the things that we've we've discussed, and what I don't like is all the things we've also discussed. <laughs> <laughs> wow, insightful! I know, really deep, right? Um, but I didn't have to engage with that intellectually at all. Pretty cool, right? Um, uh, but you know, and, and for me, like, I just yeah, I, I found it difficult to engage with those things that I really wanted to engage with because they're my favorite thing to engage with, um, uh, and that just in execution. It could have been to me like so much better, and, and not just better for me, but better for like audiences in general. And I and I when I when I say audiences in general, I mean like smart audiences in general. I mean like I don't mean just like your average fucking MCU fanatic or whatever. You know, like I'm not talking about lowest common denom denominator. I'm just talking about audiences. And and I think and I think that at a certain point, all art is valid, cool, but like. <laughs> When, when you are making a film, like, for people to enjoy or to be scared or whatever your intent is, I, I just, I find it to be a hot fucking bummer that, like, the, the intent really suffered because it was, like, just so many long, long periods of time that were only interrupted by cheap jump scares. Like, and I, and I think I, I, by my definitions, that's bad filmmaking. I'll, I'll shut the fuck up past that point, and and you can feel free to I mean, take it apart. Well, I mean, the thing I I think for me, it didn't feel. And I like, find it pretentious. That's the word I was looking it for. It didn't Sorry. feel like long periods of time because it resonated on an emotional level. It felt familiar, and that's what kept me on board. Where like I I totally understand if you don't get on that wavelength I'm, and you don't resonate with it like that. I am earnestly you know, jealous of that yeah. wavelength. I am I am jealous of both of you having that experience and I'm mad I didn't also have it. Yes. <laughs> Look, Honestly, I'm not mad at you I guys. I'm mad and, I, and I, I'm mad at the movie for that. I understand like, that a lot of people <laughs> won't have that. And I, I, I think that's totally valid. This I is, think your opinion is totally valid on that. This but. is the way this is the way I look at it. I one hundred percent agree with you that there are dozens if not hundreds of ways to make this film more accessible to most audiences common denominator or more intellectual types or what there's absol what? absolutely ways that you can make it more accessible but where i'm at is that all of the new horror movies that come out every year that we talk about on this podcast are pretty accessible whether they're good or bad or whatever, you can engage with them on a 100% surface level for the most part. And even if there's deeper stuff under there and there just aren't a lot of films like this that get a theatrical release. And I think that it's important for there to be films like this, for there to be films like Begotten, for there to be films that are hyper experimental and largely inaccessible but there's something there to engage with for people who it just clicks with cuz there's plenty of shit for everybody else and the thing is i don't want that plenty of shit for everybody else i want that experience like that's i think that's why I, i'm i'm fucking i'm pissed and you know, because like, and, like I, I'm like you're not even talking about the lowest common denominator, but I'm talking about like, like what this movie could have done to better establish its intent, like to feel like that child sitting sitting alone in a dark room at night, and 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 like the the, the techniques and tools that it used to to get that point across. I think it used some really well, and I just I I just really fucking. I mean, yeah, I I think it I think at this point it's it's just entirely subjective. Because, again, I think its intent was very clearly stated and it accomplished what it was trying to do very well for me. It did not do that for you. Nope. And I think we've talked it to death at this point. Yep. Yeah, why no, don't we stick a rating? We're, we're, not, we're not here to change each no. other's minds. No. I, I, w I was about to say, let's stick a rating on all of that. But I, I do have one more thing Go I want to talk about quick. And that's 
some of the dialogue and you know audio because a lot of it is a little hard to understand at times sometimes there's subtitles sometimes there isn't i wanted to get your guys's take on that what 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 did you guys think of having subtitles some of the time but not all of the time and not being able to understand everything that's being said um i thought it was fucking annoying um it, it, once again it, uh, there there were several times there were a few times where i thought that like when it was particularly intangible i thought it was cool i thought it was effective because like the intent was clear mm -hmm. but there were times where like it was still relatively distinct and there weren't subtitles and like the film had already given me subtitles and i thought that was fucking pretentious one yeah once again like just there to frustrate me and take me out of the experience. Yeah, just taking the experience away from me. And, uh, yeah. That's what I, I thought about it. I think... That the audio was cool, though. I think that it is a cool and interesting way to make sure that it delivers exactly the information that you need and keeps everything else tantalizingly vague. Yeah. That's how I feel about it. But... I think that... I mean, the audio overall is is pretty, like, the it has a quality of, like, you know, like an old audio recording that's been, like, sitting in storage for fucking forever and is, sounds kind of like it's underwater and it's difficult to make out. And I think that the film is like, well, this is a piece of information that you need to know, so we're going to slap subtitles on it so you get it. And if it's not one of those things, then... No, you don't need subtitles. You can try to fill in with your imagination what you're hearing. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like I'm somewhere in between y'all because I feel like at times it's frustratingly impenetrable. But I think that was part of the intention. Because, again, it's a, it's a tone poem. It's not like... It's not trying to tell this very detailed narrative. It's trying to give a vibe. And it's like, just like my brain is making monsters out of the darkness my brain is also trying to fill in those those audio gaps that it doesn't give me yeah it's mm -hmm. like what what was that that was just said yeah when it's like, i can't quite i couldn't quite make it out i think i have an idea of what maybe it was said but i don't know for sure and i think that's that same kind of that uncertainty where like it's almost creepier and then but then there's times where it's like no it's very direct like put the knife in your eye <laughs> or or uh and that's where i feel like subtitles were needed yeah exactly you know? for for impact moments mm -hmm. like that or i took her mouth away like shit like that you know like those are those are moments of impact where it needs to be clear what's being said but other times like I don't know. I can't quite make that out, and that's kind of spooky. But um, yeah, no. I mean, I think it's I think it's tonally consistent with the rest of the movie. Makes sense to me. I'm a slapper rating on it. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was walking out of the movie and I was kind of trying to process my thoughts, I was feeling like a three and a half. But I think after unpacking it a little bit, like I'm I'm feeling I'm feeling a little better on it. I'm gonna give it a four out of five. This this was. This is certainly an experimental film, but for me, the experiment was a success. Um, can't really say that I recommend this to most people. If you're real into experimental film and you're adventurous enough that you want to try something that is way out there, then I would recommend it. If you like to play it safe, don't bother. Don't waste your time. You'll probably end up just being frustrated. Yeah. This is a movie I would strongly recommend to a very certain type of person. Yes. You know? To weird freaks like me. Yeah. Um, if you're a weird freak like me, watch this movie. Yeah, if I feel like you might be able to get on the wavelength of this movie and, like, put in the work that it's asking for, yeah, then I would, I would rec recommend this to you. For most people, that's not the case, and that's not even a fault of those people, you know? Um, nope. it's, this is a movie that's not for everyone, but much like you, Tease, like, after this discussion, it's, I feel like it's only strengthened my opinions on it. A lot of the imagery and vibe of this movie is gonna stick with me for a while. Um, it was gonna be a four walking out of the theater, but I'm gonna kick it up to a four and a half. There you go. I, I really like what this movie is doing, and I haven't 
ever seen a movie like this before, a full length movie like this before. And I respect that. I respect that it's territory that I haven't quite seen before. All right, Cleve, dramatically skew our, our average. Yes, sir, too. Oh, okay. That's actually not as low as I expected you would go. No, yeah. so. I mean, uh, well, again, like, I, I am going to give give the movie those those couple of moments, the face in the dark and the final shot. It, honestly, like, I, I wish it hadn't been executed as a jump scare, but I did like the imagery of the girl with her face removed. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, like, the dialogue was really cool. Like, the audio was really neat when it wasn't, you know, again, like a, a screaming jump scare. And there were some cool shots throughout, but, yeah, man, just waiting 15 minutes for a cheap jump scare uh is shit and i hate it and um i'm i'm angry at it and uh i want to i want to feel like a child alone in the dark and be scared by that and i'm just yeah bitter and bitter and pissed that i i didn't get that out of this movie all right well that will give us an average of three and a half out of five for skinnamarink last thing i'll say is if you've seen skinnamarink and you dig it I would definitely recommend checking out Kyle Edward Ball's YouTube channel, Bite Size Nightmares. I would strongly recommend the short film Heck that Skinnamarink oh, was based on. How long is it? 28 minutes. Oh, it's... And, uh, okay. I... It's, it's, <laughs> it's different from Skinnamarink. It's got, a, obviously, a lot of the same DNA. Um, honestly, I think Heck is, uh, is maybe better than skin of Marink. i think the short film might be but well it's short it's got so it's got it's probably it's got a, it's got a couple of particular gut punches that left me feeling like particularly bad uh like in, in, in i mean yeah <laughs> if, I, if i'm trying to engage with that yeah like it's trying oh, yeah. to make me feel bad and who boy it did it so if you vibe with skin of Marink, check that out if not don't bother <laughs> um next week we have the complete opposite of Skinnamarink in every way possible. It's an episode we actually already recorded. Um, it was, uh, it's my pick, my first pick yeah. of the year. Mm. And you know, 2022 was the year of the sequel. We had our little gimmick. And we're not doing a pick gimmick this year because it's constricting. But I've decided that I have sort of an unofficial gimmick for myself for my own picks this year. In 2023, it's the year of the three C's. Carpenter, Cronenberg, Creatures. Ooh. Three things that like we it. need more of Hell on this yeah. podcast. And next week, we're going in the creature category because uh, we're talking about Anaconda, the 1997 mm-hmm. B movie starring Jennifer Lopez, John Voight, <laughs> and Ice Cube. We, like I said, we already recorded this episode. It was a fun one. It's probably one of our horniest episodes <laughs> in a while. It's so funny to me because like Carpenter and Cronenberg are just like a little bit like higher tiered, and then you've just got like Creature, which is like here we go, lowest common denominator. Let's fucking go. Like, <laughs> man, you couldn't have a movie so drastically different oh, from Skinnering. Carpen- as anaconda i know i think it's yeah. per- it's like it's perfect it's counter programming to a team. perfect counter programming oh, yeah. so yeah come back next week and listen to our super horny episode on uh anaconda before we wrap up oh we no wait predictions. We have predictions yes that's right we have the results in for megan mathregan mathregan i hope they're good oh yes. hey speaking of mathregan while you're looking up those results new news on mathregan a rated R cut will be coming out at some point. An unrated, an unrated, cut. unrated cut, even yeah. better. Because yeah. apparently the decision to make it PG thirteen, which we harped on or I harped on a lot in that episode, is uh, was something that the studio decided to do in post. So apparently the film originally had a much higher body count and way gorier kills, which is something that I was complaining about. So Same. very hype yes. for the Mathrigan unrated we'll cut soon to, to come. We'll have Figure to revisit it. that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so for Mathrigan, um, Rotten Tomatoes, I predicted 76, Tease, you predicted 84, and Cleve, you predicted 75. Right now, it's sitting at 95. Yeah, boy! <laughs> so, Tease, you get the first yeah, point. Yeah, boy! And, Skinnamarink uh, is? No, no um, Mathrigan. Oh, yeah, okay. Good. We didn't We didn't do our... Right, uh, okay, sorry. Yeah, for yeah, that yeah, last episode. Yes. Yeah. We gotta oh, wait yeah, till awesome. next week yeah. for that. 95, uh, oh, yeah. Opening weekend box office, I predicted 22 mil. 
TC predicted 28 mil, and Cleve, you predicted 9 mil. Right now, it's sitting at 30.4 Whoa. mil. Yeah, boy. A huge dog. hit. It had an even Good. better opening weekend than Smile, I was reading. You love to see it, folks. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then finally, collective rating. Um, I believe we gave it a 3.8. That sounds right. Um, I predicted 3.8. Ooh. Uh, TC predicted 4.3. And Cleve, you predicted 3.5. So I get that one on the money. Um, taglines for that one. Um, maybe AI was a mistake. Malignant meets Brahms the boy and batshit. Oh, mine I was, was just batshit. I was kind of right about Malignant meets Brahms the boy. Yeah. yeah. I was right it was batshit. It was that. Yeah. Not as batshit as it could have been. That's why we're waiting for her, the unrated cut. Her singing to the girl was pretty batshit. Pretty batshit. That was yeah, pretty, <laughs> pretty deranged. Yeah, honestly. Well, in all uh, the best ways. Yeah, we're recording this the opening weekend of Skin and Marink, so we don't have those numbers yet. We won't have it next week either since we've already recorded that episode. But in two weeks... We'll have results for Skin of Marink. Let's do that sponsor. Yo, this week is brought to you by that spooky, scary skeleton pussy. <laughs> Figure it out. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, yeah, I mean, that speaks for itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, thanks for listening. If you like the show, you can leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. That's the best way to support us and help get, a, up, get us up in the numbers. You can also support us at patreon.com slash podpeoplepod. Shout out to honorary pod boys, Sam Simon, Zach Confer. Y'all are amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at podpeoplepod and at letterbox.com slash podpeoplepod, where you'll find a list of all the films we've talked about on the show with our average ratings and links to those reviews. I am on Twitter at some spooky snake. I'm on Twitter at Mr. Sheets. And you can find my work on DreadXP.com amongst all the super cool games that uh, the studio is making. I'm doing art on them, uh, but primarily art directing on Creepshow and is having a great fucking time on that. So uh, stay tuned. It's going to be a while. But uh, yeah, look out. Uh, We've got a bunch of cool games coming. Well, uh... Skinema Rinky, Skinema Rinky Do. Skinema Ball. I love you. Skinema Ball. Skinema, think about it, Ooh. folks. It's deep. Thank you.